you guys hammer home the importance of latency, of focusing on latency. Uh, so why is latency such a central concern for a data engineer? As a data engineer, you're always thinking about what your latency compromises are so that you can essentially optimize around the CAP theorem to get the kind of result that you need. And the same would apply if you're working with streaming technologies. And data engineers really serve the purpose of flipping the funnel on its head of what a data scientist is expected to do. It's really you know, serving the interests of the data scientist if, if data engineering is done correctly. Joe and Matt, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast for the first ever three-party, <laughs> uh, three, three-way Super Data Science experience. Um, so welcome to the program. It's an honor to be having uh, this first uh, with you two. Uh, so we kind of broke the experience then. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. Um, so for listeners who are listening to the audio only version, the really deep sultry sound is Matt. Uh, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I, my voice is kind of like that anyway, I guess, but I, I was hanging out at a bar last night at a data engineering event actually, and I had lost my voice. And so this is the aftermath of that, I guess. So it, it sounds, sounds like great. I've been smoking for, you know, 20 years or something. <laughs> yeah. Alcohol is such a party animal. <laughs> yeah, if you became an alcoholic, it would do wonders for your radio voice. So. That oh, fantastic. Awesome. So take up yeah. smoking and alcohol. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Joe also has a very nice voice. It just is, it is distinctly not as deep as Matt's. So it should be easy for listeners uh, to pick up on who is speaking. I'm still developing. So, you know, just give it a few years. <laughs> that explains the facial, the facial hair differences as well. Yeah, my voice will crack once in a while. So, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> All good, though. All right, guys, so this episode is all about data engineering. What is data engineering? So data engineering is the development, implementation, and maintenance of systems and processes that take in raw data and produce high quality, consistent information that supports downstream use cases, for example, analysis, machine learning, data science, um, reporting, operational analytics, very typical use cases inside a business, in fact. Nice. Um, Joe, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to kind of summarize that, you know, a data engineer takes data from source systems, makes it useful for uh, downstream use cases and uh, users like data scientists, right? So. So, so we're taking relatively raw data and then having it automatically processed in a pipeline and so that it can be used downstream for analytics, business intelligence, for machine learning, um, anywhere downstream where we need to have the data cleaned up in some way, maybe uh, merged together. Uh, you know, you're going to often have lots of different raw data sources that need to be merged together. Does that sound like a, a reasonable paraphrase? Yeah, of the that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that too. So uh, data engineers really serve the purpose of flipping the funnel on its head of what a data scientist is expected to do. So there's this um, you know, kind of this old trope about how data scientists spend 80, 90% of their time getting data, cleaning data, um, you know, munging data, all this kind of stuff. Really, that should be the job of a data engineer, which means that the data scientist should, in theory, spend, uh, you know, 80, 90% of their job doing the things that they're trained to do, which are data modeling, algorithms, analysis, uh, you know, machine learning, and so forth, right? So. It's really, you know, serving the interests of the data scientists if, if data engineering is done correctly. Yes, yeah. and data scientists would love to be in that position. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's the ideal. Yeah, and that's part of what we're advocating for with our book. Like, we need to clearly define this role and what the purpose of this role is so that data scientists can be more successful in their jobs and machine learning engineers and analysts and so on. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into that a little bit. So we're talking yeah. about data engineers and data scientists you two both identify as recovering data scientists. So what does that mean? And <laughs> where did that come from? And uh, you know, are there any, is there anything that you guys miss <laughs> from being data scientists? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. And I think Matt's yeah. got a very, he's got his uh, own take on this, but yeah. so, you know, I've been, I've been in data for a long time. Um, and I would say, you know, kind of when the, um, the term data science started getting popular in the early 2010s. Um, what I had noticed and what I experienced was getting hired for uh, 
you know, data science type of jobs or seeing friends get hired uh, for data science jobs. And then spending most of their time doing non-data science-y things. So back then, data science, I think, was much more closely aligned with machine learning. Um, you know, maybe today it's it's broadened its scope a bit. But the point remains that uh, they're just... What I noticed is there wasn't a lot of... There wasn't a lot of data upon which to do science, right? So the foundations weren't there, um, i.e., you know, data wasn't um, either collected or stored in a reliable manner or wasn't collected or stored at all. Um, if it was, something, most often the data was kind of crap and, you, you know, you'd have to kind of make do with that. And so recovering data scientists, I think, was more of a reaction. It was sort of, you know, it, so the etymology of it was, uh, I think it was uh, Dave Gonzalez and Ben Taylor, who, who live in Salt Lake with me. We were uh, calling each other um, kind of reformed or recovering data scientists back then. And just the name kind of stuck and, you know, sort of, um, you know, went with that. But it was really the recognition that I felt like data science was just a very premature um but overhyped uh you know field that somehow was both the sexiest job of the 21st century but uh perhaps the um most idle job of the 2010s <laughs> so matt well, i don't know what your take on the, the recovering data scientists is but yeah so so when i met joe we started talking about our experiences and i had experiences very similar to joe perhaps even amplified a bit in the sense that Early, so I came from, you know, background in mathematics, PhD in math, taught for a long time. And I was hired into this data science team uh, by an executive that frankly was really struggling. And they were like, all right, we're creating this data science team. It's going to be magic. We're going to fix all this company's problems. And we're just going to kill it because data science is amazing. And you can do really cool stuff that we could never do before. And then as I get fur got further into the job, I discovered that even though we had a lot of systems and we had a lot of data, we had Hadoop, we had a data warehouse, things just really weren't in place to make data science work. And there were no systems to like attempt to get data off of laptops into production processes and to actually score models in real time and that kind of thing. And the data often wasn't in the correct shape to even do any interesting data science on it. And so... I gradually just kind of migrated and learned, you know, at the time the whole world was going through a transition to cloud, which is still happening. So I just kind of migrated and learned cloud tools and learned data engineering and began to serve those use cases um, for other data scientists within that company to make their jobs easier. And so when Joe started talking about this notion of recovering data scientists, I'm like, yeah, that that's very much me. And of course, there's a bit of a, you know, joking and trolling going on there. But the point is mm -hmm. to just call the fact out that, we, we're not meaning to insult data scientists. It's more like you have to have good data engineering. To yeah, we started a group science. like uh, uh, Data Scientists Anonymous. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, but, but in all seriousness, it, it's one of those things where I, I think, you know, and increasingly we, we see this where we run into people who uh, come from data science backgrounds, right? And inevitably it, it's very similar experiences. Yeah. So at first, you know, we, we were kind of like, you know, we felt like we were just two crazy guys like screaming at the sky. Um, <laughs> Which I suppose is still true, but um, but we realized there were, there were other uh, crazy people also screaming at the sky, and, and so um, you know, so at least at least we know we're not alone. Nice, so. yeah. So you have your yeah, you've got your little DSA, your Data Science Anonymous uh, group. Mm -hmm. You guys can be <laughs> shouting at the sky together and acknowledging that uh, uh, it. Uh, luckily, there is a cure. All right, uh, and so data engineering is part of the cure. And so what kinds of skills or personalities distinguish a data engineer from a data scientist? Like why would somebody become a recovering data scientist and a data engineer as opposed to just staying as a data scientist? Um, and do you think there's value or what do you think the value is in data scientists who still want to be data scientists, will have that be their primary title, developing data engineering skills? You want to take that, Matt? Uh, this is, so that's a very good question, and, and I'll try to answer all the parts of that the best I can, and Joe can jump in as well. Um, I, think, I think part of it is you have to identify what's going on in your company and what you're going to do about it. So in other words, if you find yourself in a situation like Joe and I have been in, in the past where you're hired as a data scientist to do magic and these other places aren't in peace, or other pieces aren't in place, excuse me, um, you either have to advocate for creation of a data engineering org to deliver the data that you need to do your job, or you need to take on the job yourself. 
Um, what I've generally found is that people who really love statistical approaches to problems uh, maybe do better on the data science side. Right. And so from my academic world, I, uh, my, my background is more in pure math and what's called the representation theory where you're writing a lot of proofs and things like that. And many of uh, people in my cohort were working more in applied math and uh, studying more like statistical problems or differential equation simulations and such. Mm -hmm. And so in general, I found that like just from that narrow slice of, of humanity that <laughs> exists in math, um, a lot of my friends who came from the pure math side who really liked writing proofs and like drilling into hard logic and such have done well moving into data engineering because it's kind of right. similar to that. It's not just building systems, but it's like problem solving and troubleshooting and then coming up with concepts for logical flows that will fix problems. Um, whereas my friends more on the applied math and statistical side have really enjoyed data science and machine learning and such. It's not to say that there's no crossover, but that, that's kind yeah. of the personality profile I've seen. Eliminating unnecessary distractions is one of the central principles of my lifestyle. As such, I only subscribe to a handful of email newsletters, those that provide a massive signal to noise ratio. One of the very few that meet my strict criterion is the Data Science Insider. If you weren't aware of it already, the Data Science Insider is a 100% free newsletter that the Super Data Science team creates and sends out every Friday. We pour over all of the news and identify the most important breakthroughs in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. The top five, simply five news items. The top five items are handpicked, the items that we're confident will be most relevant to your personal and professional growth. Each of the five articles is summarized into a standardized, easy to read format, and then packed gently into a single email. This means that you don't have to go and read the whole article, you can read our summary and be up to speed on the latest and greatest data innovations in no time at all. That said, if any items do particularly tickle your fancy, then you can click through and read the full article. This is what I do. I skim the Data Science Insider newsletter every week. Those items that are relevant to me, I read the summary in full. And if that signals to me that I should be digging into the full original piece, for example, to pour over figures, equations, code, or experimental methodology, I click through and dig deep. So, if you'd like to get the best signal-to-noise ratio out there in data science, machine learning, and AI news, subscribe to the Data Science Insider, which is completely free and no strings attached, at superdatascience.com slash DSI. That's superdatascience.com slash DSI. And now, let's return to our amazing episode. That's cool. I have not heard that before, but I can kind of imagine how that makes a lot of sense. Um, not having, yeah, done the thought experiment very thoroughly on my side, um, but being one of these people who loves applications of math and statistics, and I gravitate towards data science, so I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're on the money here. I mean, there, I, there are a well, bunch of math people in this field. Go ahead, Joe. I don't know what you're saying. Oh, I was just going to say there, there are tons and tons of math people in both of these fields I've found. I mean, at one point, how many, we had like five math people at our company at one point, Joe, is that right? <laughs> like, yeah, I think it was almost <laughs> like a re, a, an implicit requirement yeah. that we did like, say so, but they just happened to grab it. I think yeah. nerds tend to attract nerds though. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's just like math degree tractor beam that we sort of have, but um so I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on what Matt said. I think that there's also, it, it depends. So for a data scientist to become a data engineer, I think you need to um, understand where you are in your career too, um, and the type of company you're in and their data maturity, right? So if you're a data scientist who's been hired by a company that's pretty low in the data maturity and you're the only data person there, um, either it's going to be you or the software engineer that, that ends up building the systems that will support data science. Right. So you know, if you're fortunate enough to have an engineer, the, the challenge with the software engineer is going to be they have the engineering chops, but they don't understand data. You understand data, but you don't have the engineering chops. So you're going to have to figure out how, how you're going to split the, that, uh, you know, those roles and responsibilities. But ultimately, you know, for data science, science to, to you know, um, you know, level up, you're going to have to have some semblance of data engineering. And so that's where we see, you know, data scientists, I, I guess, making a decision of whether or not they like data engineering. You know, I'd say it's a pretty 50-50 split, honestly. Like I think as Matt pointed out, it just depends on your temperament and your background. 
if, if you tend to be the type of person who likes to tinker and you like deterministic outcomes, engineering is probably more of a, you know, suited for you. If you come from a, like an applied math background, like I, I have an applied math background, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, um, so stats is kind of my jam used to be, I don't really do it much anymore, but you know, I, I, I understand it and, you know, machine learning and so forth done that. And it's like, I, I like that aspect of it. Um, if I had my choice, I mean, I, you know, if I didn't get into data engineering, I'd probably still be doing it. I, I really love data and I love solving these types of problems, but, um, cool. you know, I guess, I guess I like solving other types of problems too. Yeah. And it's cool that you guys mentioned earlier on when you were explaining this recovering data scientist thing, you mentioned Ben Taylor, uh, who's also out in Utah, yep. uh, with you guys. And, uh, at this time we are running a series of five minute Friday episodes featuring Ben Taylor. So, Ooh. um, hmm. the last two five minute Friday episodes, as well as the next two five minute Friday episodes will feature Ben Taylor answering specific, uh, targeted questions. Um, Very cool. Let's dig into his expertise. We absolutely love Ben on the show. He's been um, a proper guest on guest episodes um, about as much as anybody else has in the history of this program. Uh, really fascinating data scientist. Anyway, uh, enough about Ben. You'll get enough of him in the Five Minute Fridays. Um, you guys have a book that has just come out. Um, so the ebook version has been available for about a month or two. And the physical copies are starting to ship right about now, right about at the air date of this episode. Uh, so you should be able to grab it on Amazon or whatever your preferred um, retailer is. And O'Reilly, who's the publisher of the book, has uh, very kindly given me three copies to give away. So look out on the morning that this episode comes out, Tuesday morning, um, uh, I will post on LinkedIn that the episode is out and the first three people that comment on my post about the episode and ask for a copy of the ebook will get one for free from O'Reilly. So thanks very much for that. The book is called Fundamentals of Data Engineering and you two are the two co-authors of the book, Joe and Matt. Uh, Joe is holding up a copy of the coveted book right now. Somehow, He's managed to get a physical copy before it's even available. Don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, to kind of introduce this book, we've got a great question from Leandro Mora, who uh, asked me a question on Twitter. I mentioned on Twitter as well as on LinkedIn that we were going to be having you guys on the show uh, and that I'd be interviewing you about the book. And Leandro asked uh, this question. He said, there are many books written about best practices for data engineering. Uh, one of his favorites is Designing Data Intensive Applications, which also is an O'Reilly book. Mm -hmm. um, so Leandro wants to know, what new ideas are you guys going to expose in this new book? So I'd say, you know, my, my favorite book on data engineering up to this point has been Designing Data Intensive Applications. I think it's a fantastic book. Um, Martin Kleppman, the author, was actually one of our technical reviewers. So shout out to Martin for, um, uh, you know, reviewing our book. I, I would say when we wrote the book, we did survey the entire landscape of data engineering books. Mm -hmm. And what we found was, whereas I think there, there, were, there were some gems like Martin's book, which I think was very classic and, and stood the test of time, a lot of the books felt very ephemeral. Like it was data engineering on platform X, Y, or Z, or, or tech, you know, using language know abc or whatever and and what the big question that matt and i always had was well okay i, th I think these, these these books definitely serve a purpose in terms of teaching you um tactics you know on particular platforms or technologies but mm -hmm. there really wasn't a book that we'd found that taught you the the thought processes and a strategy behind data engineering in a in a way that the book would remain fairly timeless over the years Right. So the, the challenge was, how do you write a book on a fast moving field that will be relevant um, several years from now? Right. And when we pitched the book idea to O'Reilly, you know, they, they said, you guys are nuts. Um, like, why would you write a book like this? This is this is hard. Nobody's written this for a reason. It's not because it's a bad idea. It's because it's a very hard book to write. Right. Um, so Matt and I, you know, um, being the gluttons for punishment that we are, said, OK, that's <laughs> cool. So we'll come back to you with a book proposal. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, flesh that out and, you know, as, as 
far as we heard that, you know, the, the book was, uh, you know, once the book proposal was, it was in, it was greenlit, I think in some of the fastest time I, that our editor had heard of at O'Reilly. Cause it's like, we really do need this book. Um, it was, uh, Jess Haberman, the acquisition. Yeah, editor, right? exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Shout out to Jess. Awesome. Um, person. And, and so that's where I would say this book is different is that it, the new ideas, um, Leandro asks, well, the, the big ideas behind the book are twofold, right? So the, the first big idea is a data engineering life cycle, right? So the path that data takes through a, a data engineer's, um, you know, hands and capacity and so forth. But you also have to think of what, what undercuts that life cycle, right? And so we're talking about things like data management, ops, orchestration, architecture, you know, security and um, software engineering. So it's, it's really, I think the, the big ideas are, are actually the most simple ideas or have been hiding in plain sight the entire time, but I would say haven't been clearly articulated up until this point. Matt, what do you, what do you think about uh, Leandro's yeah, question? Yeah, I agree. And for this question, I'm actually going to loop back to the discussion earlier of the definition of data engineering. Um, I think in our data cultural milieu, there was this weird, um, there were a lot of bad definitions of data engineering floating around for years and years. And oh, geez, Matt, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for example, I, I think when I got started in this world, the definition of data engineering is, oh, a data engineer is someone who works with Hadoop and, and Pig and MapReduce and maybe this cool new thing called Spark. And then a few years later, it was like, oh, a data engineer is someone who works with Spark and maybe mm -hmm. Databricks or something like this. Mm -hmm. And none of that actually captures what data engineering really is about, which is about managing data flows and serving end users and end use cases. Those are technologies. Uh, Hadoop was useful in its day. Spark is pretty useful now. But th those are tools. It's like saying a car is a clutch plus some um, pistons plus maybe an electrical system. That that doesn't get to what a car well, it is. Even it gets worse because it's, it's yeah. talking about brand names. So a car yeah, yeah. is a you know set of Michelin tires, or, <laughs> right, right. or or you know to bring it back to data science, like data science. How would you feel, John, if we said data science is um, the use of TensorFlow to with Keras? And some scikit-learn mixed in on, you know, right. NVIDIA GPUs. I mean, would that would that be a fitting description of data that's science? A, that's a timeless definition, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, that'll be our next book. Um, just kidding. Yeah. So, but but I'll, I'll but look the, back. Go ahead. Oh, no, but it felt like the definitions, I, I think what Matt was saying, you know, yeah. is, is the definitions felt very naive. Like, it was very superficial, right? And so, um, um and that, that's what I felt like we needed to address because uh, the easy book to write would have been like data engineering with platform X, Y, or Z or language A, yeah. B, and C. Right. right. Yeah. Right. The, the Martin Klutman book, I, that's a fantastic book and I want to give him a shout out right here. But what I'd say about that book is that it's intended for two audiences. So audience number one is FANG engineers who are working on a very specific, at one point we called this primordial data engineering, which is they're actually working way down in the guts of tools. So you might have an engineer at Google who works on Colossus, their data storage system, and they need to understand clocks and synchronization and inconsistencies and such. And the, the second target audience for this book is people who maybe are working with Spark or Snowflake and don't need to worry about those issues day to day, but need to kind of understand them in the back of their mind. And that that doesn't, it, it's a, I think any data engineer should read it, but it doesn't really explain what the whole job is about. And so our goal with this book was to write a book that would kind of complement all the technical books that are out there to say, take what you learn from Martin, take what you learn from, you know, Spark fundamentals, and then bring it into this bigger picture of how you can actually serve data science, machine learning, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, John, to kind of bring it back to something you're probably familiar with, right? So and we, we both lift. And so I would say design data intensive applications is sort of the book about like how to you know how do muscles work and, and like what how how do energy systems work right ATP fires and does stuff and there's you know different energy systems and that's I think really the equivalent of designing data intensive applications but it doesn't really get into okay so like you know lifting like how do you just go about like being a lifter and getting better at that at that right that's um, I, I would say is a really um, good analogy that maybe you might identify with personally because we're both meat heads. So <laughs> that's a lovely analogy. All of my meat loves it. Um, so thank you so much for telling us uh, about the audience. Cause that was exactly what, what I was going to ask you next. Perfect. Uh, do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of the topics that are covered? So we've talked about why this book um, exists. We've talked about the audience. 
Um, and then, yeah, give us a rundown of the topics. And in particular, maybe give us a rundown of the topics uh, that might be particularly interesting to people who want to be data scientists or want to stay data scientists. They're not thinking about becoming strictly data engineers, but they want to have some more data engineering under their belt. Yeah. Um, so I would say our, again, our core audience for this book is data engineers. But the point is that as a data scientist, if you read this book, it, it's kind of like understanding where your food is coming from or something like that. And then of course, not just understanding, oh, my food is farm to table and this restaurant tells me where it comes from, but also mm -hmm. how to communicate back to your data engineering stakeholders about your needs. Or in some cases, we see this often in a small company, you're hired as a data scientist and you actually kind of have to build a data engineering team. In other words, you have to help the company make that first hire to say, hey, we don't have people to build these pipelines so I can do my job. So this is the kind of person we need to look for to accomplish that task. And so we do feel like, you know, maybe a data scientist isn't going to be reading the book as deeply in certain technical areas, but they'll get a really nice picture of what data engineering is all about and why they should care and how it's complementary and how they can work together with data engineers. Super cool. Um, sounds like an invaluable book for a lot of data science listeners out there. So yeah, so check it out. Fundamentals of Data Engineering. Um, to get into some specific questions related to content in your book, um, hat tip to Serge Massis, our researcher on Serge. the show, yeah, who, whom you guys uh, both know. Um, so one of the questions that uh, he brought up is that in your book, you guys discuss the fundamental technologies and methodologies used in the data engineering lifecycle. Can you walk us through the major undercurrents, what you guys call the undercurrents, across this data engineering lifecycle? Sure. Uh, I'll take half and then Matt can take the other half. Okay. <laughs> so I think there's, uh, what, six or seven of them or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first, the first one is security. I mean, that, that's... Um, uh, so security is one of these things where we feel like if you can't get security right, it, nothing else really matters. Uh, if you right. have a data breach, um, this, this puts such a, uh, this kneecaps you in such a way that, you know, it's, it's going to be hard for you to get trust or recover from it. Um, and so security is the number one undercurrent. Um, and a lot of security ends up being, uh, you know, behavioral as, as you find out when you read about hacks, for example, right? Uh, Hacks occur for a lot of reasons or breaches occur, but it's not for um, because you have awesome hackers It's because people get sloppy. They might unintentionally unveil passwords in a phishing scheme or, um, you know, leave servers or object storage buckets open to the public, among a lot of other things. But these are just really simple things that we, we feel like people, should, you know, data engineers, data scientists should just keep top of mind. Security is the first undercurrent. Um, again, it's not really a technology issue so much as it is a behavioral and uh, people issue, but we, we do think that's the first one. The second one would be data management. Mm -hmm. So this is a giant topic, actually. So we, we got the idea of data management um, as being an undercurrent. As we were going through the book, we're kind of like, okay, so where would data governance fit in and, and um, you know, data uh, you know, stewardship and all this other stuff, and like, you know, all these uh, topics that data management encompasses. Um, if you want to really good understanding of data management. You should just go read the um, uh, DEMA uh, Book of Knowledge. Um, it's a uh, giant um, tome of uh, every conceivable aspect of data management, which is somehow and it ends up encompassing every conceivable aspect of data, but we took the best parts. So, you know, um, data management is just one of these things where we feel like that's um, definitely an undercurrent. Governing your data, sh you know, should be front and center. Um, you know, among a lot of other aspects of it. But then this brings us to, to another undercurrent, data ops, right? So data ops is, you know, observing, monitoring, um, you know, and being able to respond to incidents uh, in your data, right? So this, um, you know, is, is the third undercurrent. Matt, do you want to go over the, the, the other ones? Yeah. So the next one is data architecture. And, you know, even if you're coming from a data science background, that, problem, that one's probably pretty obvious that it should be there somewhere. And the thing I'll say about data architecture is that it's not just technology. It's about a lot of other things. And so we obviously go deeper on that in the book. Um, and orchestration is next. And the interesting thing about orchestration is that not only does it cut across all stages of the data engineering lifecycle, but it kind of cuts into the data science side too. So in other words, what is orchestration? What is yeah, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. So it basically means that it's like... Um, Think of being on the New York subway system and you have all these switches that have to route trains the right way and you have to make sure that they don't collide. And, you know, there's all kinds of 
management of uh, asynchronous processes going on to make sure that trains can get where they need to go and that they don't run into each other. People don't get hurt. People don't get killed. Mm-hmm. And orchestration for data is kind of the same thing. Like it's basically a switchyard manager that says, okay, first I need to ingest the data. Then I need to post-process it. Then I'll actually I have this other data over here I'm ingesting. Once data is ingested from those two sources plus another source, then I'm going to join those sources together and then cutting over kind of to the data science side. Okay, once those three data sets have been joined together, I'm going to trigger the training of a model. And to understand the importance of orchestration, um, I mean, orchestration systems have been around for a long time, but you've got like Airflow, Prefect, Dagster, Coalesce, DBT, and so on. You have so many different orchestration systems in the marketplace right now. And that's just been driven by the fact that no matter how good your data processing technology is, it can't really be very effective or support data science very well unless you may gatekeep all these different systems asynchronously. Cool. And the, it's also software engineering, right? And then software so, engineering is the last one. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so the point is on that undercurrent, um, as, as a data engineer, no matter what tools you're using, you're going to have to do a lot of software engineering, cutting across many different systems and many different capabilities. So you'll notice that we actually kind of sidestep Serge's answer or question as well. Yeah. He asked for technologies. Um, yeah. But I think the whole point behind the book is that it's it's meant to be technology agnostic. Um, like We feel like these are very much uh, the things that do undercut um, the data engineering life cycle, but at the same time, uh, yeah. technologies come and go, right? Yeah, like this, no, is, he, this is a fact. So, yeah, he he uh, he. his question was just to go through these uh, six undercurrents Okay. And he mentions that in the book, you guys do cover the fundamental technologies and methodologies that are used in it today. Um, yeah, I mean, there which, are types of technologies, I would say, um, you know, so there are, you know, data warehouses, for example, are very common uh, for storing data and, and, you know, being able to query it. Same with data lakes and data lake houses and so forth. Various data pipelines, orchestration um, frameworks and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's... It's interesting because there, there's fundamental technologies that are, I would say, sort of intertwined with fundamental practices. So, cool. And adding to that, um, the one thing we emphasize is that we kind of give a snapshot of the technology picture today, but new technologies come out every month. And so you kind of right. have to slot those into the framework as they arrive and assess accordingly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So, another one related to your. Uh, to content in your book, uh, and also kind of related to the idea of a current or a stream. Uh, I guess that is a kind of a an easy analogy uh, to understand with lots of data flows and data engineering. Um, so in the book, you mention how a data engineer must constantly communicate with downstream stakeholders. So uh, why is that so important? Can you elaborate on that? I think... A lot of what we've seen is that actually this goes against the grain of how most companies are set up. And so typically what happens is application developers uh, create data schemes in transactional databases to support their application. And they might use ORM or something so that they're pretty hands off on what the schema even looks like. And then that kind of gets shipped downstream to say, hey, data engineers, take care of this mess that I created and make some sense of it. And I think increasingly what we're seeing now is that there's an interest in integrating the application development layer, uh, application development kind of vertical with the data engineering side of things. And ideally, there's bi-directional communication for data engineers to say, this is what I need from you guys on the application side. And then the data engineers can then feed that back data back to the application developers to provide capabilities like embedded analytics, to have real-time dashboards for their users, for example, to have dashboards that show what's going on for that company in the SaaS platform. And so that's an organizational evolution that we, we really want to push. Like We just feel like those teams should not be isolated from each other and that data engineering is actually an application developer's problem too, even though it's not their role. Right. That bi-directional communication. But wasn't the question about downstream stakeholders with data? It was, data it was about downstream, yeah, yeah, definitely. But I'm thinking of it as bi-directional. So, yeah. yeah and, but I mean, so I think what yeah. Matt, Matt does highlight, though, is something that has traditionally been the case with, um, you know, engineers do lob things over the wall, but then data engineers may yeah. take that same tendency and lob it over the wall to data scientists yeah, and so that's forth. That's also true. Yeah. And, and so I, what I do think is um, data scientists 
an analyst could make really good data engineers because they understand what the outcome should be, right? right. So if you, if you've if you know what a, what a machine learning model should look like or a report should look like, this this is uh, very advantageous. Same same way that Matt described with a software engineer, for example, if if you don't know what the outcome is with the data um, that you're providing, you have no empathy, and so you're just throwing things over the wall and saying, "Deal with it; it's your problem." You yeah. know, and this is super super common. In much the same way, if a data engineer doesn't understand, you know, what the data scientist or the analyst needs at the end of the day, these downstream stakeholders, then it's, um, you know, you're you're simply doing what you think is your job. But I, I would really question: Are you doing your job, or are you um, simply going through the motions of what feels convenient or might be uh, sort of the cultural norm of your company? If your cultural right. norm is to throw things over the wall. <laughs> that's what you're going to do right? right this happens a lot of places this is sort yeah, of i would sure. say the default because it's, it's yeah. just like not my problem not my job so that's yeah. that's why i think communicating with downstream stakeholders and upstream stakeholders to matt's point um you know these are these are both insanely important and we cover this in the book there's a, in each under on each um stage of the engineering life cycle we talk about who you work with right and we give advice for how you should talk to people talking to people in communication these are two of the areas where it's we see, we think this is like the most underutilized tool in a data engineer's toolbox, right? It's easy to stand up infrastructure. It's easy to right. to it's easy to read books like ours. The hard part is to go and actually like talk to somebody, understand what they need, understand how they can help you, um, let them understand you know how they can help you as well, and so forth. Like that 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 sort of communication, I think, is like super underrated. And I would say like 90 plus percent of the problems I see with data teams and their ability to get stuff done comes down to communication or lack thereof with other stakeholders, whether they're upstream or downstream. Beautiful. That was a really great answer. Um, and we've got one last question about specific content in the book. Um, and so this is about something that is throughout the book. So throughout Fundamentals of Data Engineering, you guys hammer home the... Uh, the importance of latency, of focusing on latency. Uh, so why is latency such a central concern for a data engineer? Yeah, it's not just a concern. It's also, I, I think the big theme would be understanding trade-offs around latency. And one of the mistakes we see rookie data engineers make when they're migrating from software development is using a transactional database to try to do, solve data engineering problems. It can work okay, but the problem is that a transactional database is designed to deliver extremely low latency on transactions. It's very, very good at that. It's not as good as sc at scanning large amounts of data. And so the compromise you make is you move to like a columnar database, for example, where updates of data are slow and typically Queries take a while to run. They might take like half a second or a second to run. But now you can efficiently scan, you know, like a petabyte of data instead of looking efficiently at just a small amount of data. And that's just one example. I think the point is that as a data engineer, you're always thinking about what your latency compromises are so that you can essentially optimize around the cap theorem to get the kind of result that you need. And the same would apply if you're working with streaming technologies. Um, the same would apply if you need, you know, true near real time, what are your latency trade-offs in the different parts of the pipeline? What do you think, Joe? Yeah, I think it's, it's good. I mean, there's definitely a lot of, um, I would say, uh, mistakes of omission as opposed to yeah. mistakes of commission. Right. Just simply not knowing how to use proper tools that uh, contribute to latency. But, yeah. but, but the, the broader question, okay, so why is latency important? Why is low latency important across the data engineering lifecycle? It, it's because you, you want to reduce time to value, right? So um, if it, you, you always want to assess the trade-offs of, um, am, am I able to make, is, is the downstream stakeholder able to either make an automation or an analytical decision faster and better than they were if I, if I did something else, right? And so it really starts at the place where data is generated and goes all the way to the time data is delivered. That, that should be as low of latency as possible, unless there's some compelling explanation as to why that shouldn't be. And there might be, there might be a reason why you want to actually have larger delays, but, but the default assumption should be you, you want to, um, you know, have things happen as quickly as possible. Right. Um, you know, and this, this will 
tie into some some other things we'll talk about in a bit. But um, you know, it's just data. Data is one of these things where if you can capitalize on it from the um, you know the point of um, you know conception uh, to use in, in a much faster way, uh, why would you not do that? That would seem like kind of a waste of time. No pun intended. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So we need to be aware of latency trade offs um, for the given pipeline that we're building. But uh, generally speaking, uh, faster is going to be better as a default assumption. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you have to do faster things, uh, dumber things faster, though, right? And so that, 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 which does happen as well. Right. Yeah. And fast depends on the context, right? So, like for an analytic stakeholder, 10 seconds, three seconds might be really, really fast. Whereas in an application where you need to do transactional updates, you know, over a hundred milliseconds might be really, really slow. Yeah. Right. Now, I guess it also depends on like the, the question you should always ask yourself is like, what action am I going to take if I get yes. data faster? Right. So like Matt points out, sometimes it's 10 seconds. Sometimes maybe it might be 10 days, frankly, for, for if it's a report that you know, it was just a historical report, but it really comes down to the use case. But again, our, our, our default assumption is it should be um, speed, like fast is good, right? Slow yeah. kills. So we'll, we'll sometimes have clients, though, come to us saying, hey, we need real time. And it's like, okay, that seems kind of weird for your business. Like, what do you mean by real time? <laughs> They're like, oh, two days. Two <laughs> days is real time in some cases. So to, yeah, you have right. to understand the requirements. And like Joe said, you know, yeah, optimize to go fast if you can. Nice. So we will get to your consulting practice in yeah. just a moment. But before we get there, I know that the focus of this book, as we've uh, hammered on a number of times in this episode, is not on specific tools or techniques. It's yeah. about general data engineering principles. And that's what made writing fundamentals of data engineering such a tricky task. However, that said, <laughs> uh, at this moment, are there particular data engineering tools or techniques that you recommend our data science listeners uh, check out first or focus on? I would say you know, I'll cover tools, and Matt, you can cover techniques. You know, Rochambeau yeah. on this one. Um, so, uh, tools, you, you know, there, there's a lot of great tools out there, fairly mainstream at this point. Snowflake is one, I would say. Data scientists, um, you know, would have a heyday on. Databricks is another great platform you can get a lot of leverage on. And then, you know, there's obviously the, the, each of the clouds has their own ecosystems that, um, you know, are trying to, uh, you know, get data scientists, um, you know, hooked on. So AWS has SageMaker. It's fantastic, fantastic ecosystem. Um, same with GCP's Vertex AI and Azure's ML. I mean, all these are great, great ecosystems. And so, you know, it, it's it, I think it really comes down to what, you know, if you're working at a company, what have they adopted? That, that's the first thing. If, if it's a, you know, if it's an Azure shop. Um, I think your your fate's already been sealed. You're going to be doing Azure. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, so you could you could try and lobby for something else, but you got to have a good reason. So, um, but really, at the end of the day, a lot of these platforms are fairly similar, right? It, it's like they're, they're, they have, they have their own sort of um, you know data science lifecycle, for example. Um, you know, and, and so I would say get familiar with those types of tools. I mean, those are the five big ones. I would say again, um, you know, Snowflake, Databricks, um, Azure, GCP, and um, AWS, um, and, and so, and all of them have their trade offs. So I would say just get familiar with whatever ecosystem you're in and get to know the tools. And it's not to say you have to stick with like the clouds managed tools or or you know or you know open source. Just pick what works best. But there's you know, and I mentioned open source, there's no shortage of, um, you know, the Apache ecosystem, for example, has like exploded in the past several years. So I don't even know how many Apache projects there are right now. There's probably more projects, you know, on Apache than there are like atoms in the universe at this point. But <laughs> I could say the same thing about, uh, you know, data startups, right? So if you look at Matt Turk's data landscape slide, which we intentionally put in the book in sort of humorous fashion, because it's like, it's just like a blur of a box because <laughs> there's so many micro logos or nano logos at this point but the whole point right. of that is like there's again more startups in the you know data startups in the universe and there are probably like atoms and you know a couple multiverses and so it's like right. it's just it, this there, so there's no shortage of tools and this is one of the chapters we talk about actually is chapter four talks about how to choose technologies um it's like a, I, I would think this is actually one of my favorite chapters because it goes through a lot of the ways you should think about assessing what tools you're going to pick whether it's for data engineering or for data science or even software, you know, applications. So, uh, as far as practices, Matt, what do you what do you think? 
What well, let me, let me follow up what Joe was saying about okay. like trying to orient yourself towards uh, cloud-based technologies. And uh, one of the things we talk a lot about more broadly is the utility of having data scientists migrate things they do on their laptops into a cloud environment. That's there a are a couple one. of different reasons for that. So if you use a common notebook server, that means that you are way, way more st streamlined um, in terms of working right. together as a team. We see data scientists work in isolation so much because their work just sits on a laptop and it's very, very hard to share. What are the dangers of working on the laptop, Matt? <laughs> I think we've seen this many times, like code getting deleted or data that's been transformed. You know, someone who's done a bunch of tra hand transformations and right. that gets deleted. And dependency management too. Dependency is management one, right? is a huge so nightmare. Because it works on your laptop doesn't mean it's yep. going to work in you know, the, the cloud. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so the, there's this collaboration aspect. And then also it just puts you closer to the data engineers and, and the ML engineers too, right? It's just easier to move things into production if you're already doing your work in a cloud notebook environment. doesn't mean there's they won't have to do work to transform what you're doing into something that's appropriate, but it's, it's a lot closer. It's an easier process. Um, another, not really a technology, but a language. Um, and I, I'd like your opinion on this as well, John, but like SQL, we, we see a lot of weakness in people's SQL chops and that there was kind of during the big data, you know, the Hadoop era, a certain disdain for SQL developed. And we, we advocate a lot for the utility of SQL, even for data engineers. And it's not to say that it's an end all be all technology, mm -hmm. but it lets both data engineers and data scientists move really, really fast on certain types of problems. So, for example, simple things like just filtering down data so you can drill down on particular keys. SQL can do that really, really fast if you're good at it. Um, in terms of practices, Joe, yeah, uh, better, you know, let, let's talk about the organizational practices and go back to that. Just better communication between data scientists right. and data engineers, ML engineers as well, the streamlined processes. Um, I think there sometimes in our industry is not enough emphasis on organizational aspects of the job and how it can make you uh, a lot better at the job and better actually able to leverage the technologies to do something interesting. Nice, super cool. I love that rundown of tools and techniques for us. We've got cloud-based tools like Snowflake, Databricks, AWS SageMaker, GCP Vertex AI, um, SQL was emphasized there near the end. Yeah. And then some key techniques uh, would be things like making sure that you are uh, using cloud, uh, as opposed to local development, even if you're doing uh, model development in a Jupyter Notebook, you can be doing that in the cloud instead of doing it locally. And uh, emphasizing a point from earlier in the episode uh, on cross-functional communication. Yeah, love and it. I'll add, I'll add just a quick minute too with the tools. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole other yeah. like parallel universe with uh, machine learning tools, right? Yep. So ML ops, ML engineering, um, that's like this parallel thread going on right now with data engineering. So in that realm, I mean, it's, the sky's the limit in terms of whatever technologies you want to do. So I, what I tried to do in that point was just illustrate, okay, so the, the commonalities that um, a data engineer might overlap with, but it's very possible, you know, you might be yeah. going off and doing like Metaflow or, or something like that too. So, um, so yeah, I would say for data scientists, pay attention to what's happening in ML engineering as well. Like that's a very exciting field that I would say is even less fully baked than data engineering. So yeah, so this is something that we have talked about on the show before. I've asked various people to define data engineering versus machine learning engineering. Do you guys want to take mm -hmm. a quick crack at that? Yeah, and I, I think um, really as we describe data engineering, it has its own life cycle, really from getting data from source systems to making it available to you know data scientists and and probably machine learning engineers. I, I my version of this, and I'd love Matt's version of this too, but. Machine learning engineers really pick up where the uh, data engineers leave off, right? So data yeah, engineering exactly. has a very similar life cycle, but it, it's a different life cycle, right? And, and it has a different set of requirements. Uh, everything from training models to storing features, um, you know, um, observing models, retraining models, and so forth. I mean, that's its own workflow that's, uh, I would say, separate. But I we, we do make an argument in the final chapter of the book that these these um, practices of data engineering and machine learning engineering and software engineering, um, in fact, may actually be on a collision course, um, which we can talk about in a bit. But uh, Matt, what do you think about ML engineering? I, one comment I have is that I think there's kind of some competition right now going on between data engineers and ML engineers. And sometimes we see in companies a lot of repeated work because there's inadequate integration between these teams. 
Mm. Um, so kind of like Joe was saying, I think our vision is that you, the ML engineers sort of take over where this core data engineering takes off. But by, by working together, these teams can be much, much more efficient because there's b- this big area of overlap where it's like, okay, data processing to featureize my data. Well, that's something that either data engineers or ML engineers can do. Mm-hmm. And so they should be coordinating on that kind of process. Right. Cool. Great answer. What's this collision course? I want to hear about that. <laughs> well, if you, if you, okay, so this comes back to a, it's something we talk about in the book called the live data stack, which is, you know, so we kind of, we talk, kind of took a stab at like what's next really, you know, after the um, modern data stack and, you know, the postmodern data stack and whatever else. But it, it, it's really the recognition that, okay, so applications, uh, yeah. you know, a, a, applications and uh, third party data sources are, are obviously where data originates, but um, coupling applications with more, um, you know, real time data generation, processing, um, and serving, the, the feedback loop is just going to get a lot tighter. And so the, the question really is okay, so for, um, you know, questions that are of a what and when nature, for example. So like what happened maybe on this date? And in large part, these types of questions can be automated. If I ask you what type of, a, what type of an action are you going to take on a what type of a question? Well, and now let's say that's happening in real time. I, I can make a very strong argument that, you know, these, these should be responded to um, either by code or machine learning, not necessarily in a report where you take a manual action especially when they're happening in a large volume. Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing with when questions. And this really frees up analysts to focus on why type of questions, like causal type things, right? Which is what they, you know, that's where your domain expertise comes in. But so the whole notion is getting rid of this tedium. And, but then, okay, so now automations can either happen heuristically or they could happen through machine learning models. And so this is where, because there's such a tight overlap and such a tight feedback loop, the question really is, okay, so like, where does the boundary between a software engineer and the application end and the um, machine learning and data engineers, like where does that begin and end? I think Matt sort of alluded to this when he's talking about these separation of concerns and these this competition. But when things happen much, much faster and greater volume, the, the, it, it amplifies that question much um, to a much greater degree. And so I, I really do, we, we actually question, you know, is it possible data engineering is actually called something else or turns into something else? Um, I think we're very open to this question. We're not tied to any, um, you know, religious argument about right. um, much of anything. It's entirely, I mean, we've seen this happen repeatedly in, in technology. And so I wouldn't say this be the, there's a lot of precedent for this happening. But right. if you look at the trends of where things are going, and if you kind of zoom out 10 years, um, I can make a pretty strong argument that the lines between ML and, um, you know, application software engineers is incredibly blurred. Like ML is a first class, ML is part of the application. There is not an artificial distinction. And same with analytics. Right. These are all just part of the same thing. So. Yeah, it's not clear that this is necessarily going to happen everywhere, but it's going to become much, much more common, I think. And going back to the integration discussion, you know, um, where, like Joe said, the application is just very much integrated with its analytics downstream. And the schema is designed to support both an application and the analy- embedded analytics. And you could probably argue that this has already happened at places like Uber where those analytics directly feed the application experience so they can tell you, for example, how long it's going to take your car to get there or how many cars are around you. Right. Like but I think this that's the whole, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you're hearing about data apps, yeah. right? Like this is yeah, the, the, exactly. the new hot buzzword that's in reality been around for, for a long time. But data apps are going to be front and center. And so what I think it's going to do, though, is like completely shape or you know, completely like shake up sort of how we view yeah, everything right now. Data science, um, data engineering. I think it's it's all up for um, you know speculation. Say in the next five ten years, because again, the world is moving towards a real time paradigm and and like fast right. low latency analytics, and that's just the nature of the beast. So, very cool. All right. Well, so yeah, that ended up digging into. I didn't know why you were so sure that the collision course question was going to come up later, but now I see it's because you knew I was going to ask you about the live data stack but find to have had the answer uh, now about the live data stack and the future of engineering. Let us now turn to your consulting, which has been alluded to throughout this episode. So uh, a number of times you guys have talked about things that you've seen at companies as you try to help them with data engineering. And that experience comes from your consulting firm, Ternary Data. So uh, that name there for listeners, it's like primary, secondary, ternary. (laughs) Um, 
it's amazing how often primary and secondary get used, and you don't hear ternary that often. Um, but it's just the one, well, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we have some some people uh, like partners will introduce us to customers as tyranny data. So <laughs> that was the danger of that name. We didn't realize. At first. Yeah, we didn't we didn't foresee that uh, yeah. that part. Um, but anyway, yeah, we are not tyranny data. We are called ternary data. So yes, thank you. Um, um, and so Joe is the CEO, Matt is CTO, and you guys are co-founders together. And you guys do consulting on data architecture as well as data engineering. Do you have a couple of interesting case studies beyond, you know, we've kind of had general allusions in this episode to specific kinds of, uh, sorry, to general kinds of things that you see across clients kind of recurrently, but are there um, any kind of um, illuminating case studies that describe why working with a data architecture and data engineering consulting firm can make a big difference to a company? I mean, I, I think there's a couple threads to this. One is it's amazing how many companies, um, I think, uh, fall under the same habits, um, whether they don't even realize it. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting. So architectures tend to be very much copy and paste it seems like they may read like a couple articles and say oh yeah that's the architecture we need um and so i think it's it's interesting in that regard where people i think have kind of um taken the same playbook from like you know the first uh you know page of google and sort of implemented that as their architecture um the other <laughs> the first page of see, google search results you mean search yeah yeah, 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 not, yeah. Not google.com right um <laughs> but on uh, page one of google. page one of google out of <laughs> 50 million pages um but so that's that's interesting to see uh we see a lot of um uh you know commonalities there the other area where we see a lot of commonalities is and this is interesting um so data teams are fascinating to watch um what we see is either it's data science or data engineering for example there is not really, there, there's some efforts to correct this, but there's not really like a playbook for um, a good data team, for example, or what a data team needs to know, right? So a data science team, if you're on a data science team, um, how do you pick the players on there and how do they get up to speed in a, in a common universal way where they can be effective? Now, I kind of use the analogy of like, uh, you know, say that we wanted to go, you know, um, I don't know, start SEAL Team 6 or something like that, right? We're going to go on a mission. But the, but the question is okay. So we just pick a bunch of like random people off the street. Like you could, you know, you know, you know how to use a grenade launcher, maybe or something like that. And, <laughs> but that's kind of like how how I think a lot of data science teams or or in data engineering teams are formed right now. It's like, oh, you know, databases. That's cool. Like, uh, yeah, you can join the team over here. Um, and what we see over and over is that there's just like a really uh, it's a lack of a really good knowledge foundation and a skills foundation. Um, so that's. One area where we so what we specialize in is we come in and we help coach and um, train and advise um, data teams. So we're not a, a a body shop. We don't just send in like twelve people to you know camp out of your office for the next five years and that kind of stuff. We <laughs> we really want to take the approach of it training and enabling your team to be like the best version of itself. So very cool. yeah, and I'll add like I think where we're at we're bet our best is where we can assist with a some technology changes with the technology migration and then some team reorganization as well. And so in, inside of some fairly large retailers, we've assisted with like a migration from a very restricted on-prem data warehouse system to much more flexible uh, cloud-based data architecture. And those technology changes can actually support team organization changes too, where you're going from kind of an ETL, you know, very traditional corporate paradigm of how data is transformed to a much more flexible, modern data engineering oriented paradigm where the data engineers can become integrated with the data science team to support their applications. And so those experiences have been very exciting. Um, in smaller startups, what we've often seen is that startups tend to be driven by people from the application side. And so you sometimes end up with Frankenstein's monster architecture to support analytics, you know, people running analytics on transactional databases and ETL jobs or pipeline jobs take like six hours to run. And so in those cases, often we can come in and explain some basic principles of like how to migrate uh, data engineering into appropriate systems, how to reorganize your team so that suddenly, you know, now those same jobs are taking five minutes 
and you can really think about scaling up data engineering and therefore data science that runs on top of data engineering. So like Joe said, yeah, we, we'd love to come in and more, um, not, not do the work so much, but like support teams in doing the work, help them to reorganize and help them to move to new technology. But it's a recognition too that teams really yeah. want to, yes, you know, learn this stuff and feel like the rock stars, right? And so, you know, we, we I think it was early on we we were so small that we just realized like the jujitsu move that we could do is is coming in and and really and instead of us doing the work for you and potentially having you hate our guts because we're doing your job for you, why don't we just mm -hmm. teach you how to, um, you know, kill it with this technology and and then make you look like the the hero at the end of the day? And people people nice. love that they they like they like us because now we're you know, we're, 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 um, you know, advising them and helping them and, and making them better. And, it, and, and in general, this, I think it's just a much cleaner and better approach. We feel good about the work we do. Customers like it and, and you know, devs love it. And so it's great. Nice. Sounds like a really cool model. A specific question for you, um, related to something that you said in a YouTube video, Joe, that we, uh, will include in the show notes. Um, you mentioned in that video that companies have been trying AI before they're barely doing even much simpler analytics like business intelligence. So yeah. companies want to put the cart before the horse very often with you. Um, they, you know, they, they may not have their data organized in any way. They may not have, as you mentioned, cloud system set up. They might just have information on individuals' laptops and they come to you and say, hey, we want to be an AI company. Um, so what do you do in those kinds of situations? Yeah, I think the uh, reference was uh, most companies are barely doing BI, let alone AI. Um, and, and, and that was recorded a, a couple of years ago. And I, and I still think that it holds true. Everything that we've seen still indicates that. Um, I think the, the adoption of machine learning is increasing for sure. And I think the, the um, real life use cases of machine learning are slowly increasing. But at the same time, um, it's, it's interesting. There's a, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about AI. I personally try to remove that. Um, you know, that, uh, those two letters from my vocabulary as much as possible, unless we're literally talking about AI. And I think there's a very um, definite um, use case or definition for it. But in a lot of cases, it's, it's being sold as this panacea and this sort of, um, you know, magical fairy dust that you can just, uh, you know, magically transform your company into an AI company. Mm -hmm. And an AI company, I suppose, if we're going to agree on definitions, is just some, a company that has you know, AI running everything. I don't know if it's Skynet or or <laughs> what, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's AI powered at the end of the day. But, but I guess if you try to do this, if you try to do uh, machine learning and production and try and actually make these things happen, you know how hard it is, right? And like, you need data. Um, and, you know, and this is where I see a lot of companies fall short. It's like, let's do AI. You don't even know anything about your, your data, right? You, you haven't, there's no analysis. Data probably doesn't even exist, um, but the, the prerequisite, even Google will tell you this too, is like do do analytics first before you start doing machine learning. Like this, you got to know your data. You don't just blindly jump in. Um, and, I, and I know this. What, what informed this was I used to work at a, I, I worked at a couple of automated machine learning companies as mm -hmm. an engineer, and so I know mm -hmm. firsthand how hard it is that of solving the problem of give me a data set and I'll give you some predictions. It's I think it works really well on unstructured data. Um, or maybe there's a canned kind of result where you're just doing object identification. But if mm -hmm. you're talking about structured data, rows and columns, like this is an insanely hard problem yeah, to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really hard. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll follow that up. Um, last week we had a conversation with Josh Tobin and uh, he was talking about this process of like going from a draft machine learning model all the way to a high quality production machine learning model. And he advocates for this idea that your first draft is just business logic. It might be in SQL, it might be in Python, but it's just business logic. It's like things that you kind of already know about your target audience or whatever you're trying to optimize for. And then you let that run. And then you take the feedback from that to train your next generation of model and so on. And so the point is, if you can't even do that step one, then you're not going to have a lot of success in delivering really high performance models down the line. I'm right, curious to hear your thoughts on that, John. Go ahead. Wait, oh, John, yeah, I'd love to hear your yeah, thoughts yeah. too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there, so there, there was a story that I told you guys before we started yeah. recording about uh, I, I did some consulting at a hedge fund where uh, the most senior people there, including the most senior technologists right up to the CTO, thought that their competitors were now being run by AI <laughs> and that they were going to be left behind. Um, and so 
yeah, it just from asking them follow up questions, I just discovered that people, even highly technical people who have technology platforms and could have tens of billions of dollars of assets under management, have this idea in their head from, I guess, film and television and just the word AI that, um, that somebody out there, Google, maybe that their competitors at other hedge funds, just have a machine that takes in any kind of input and spews out the answer <laughs> to whatever you want it to be doing, you to be making your buying and selling decisions if you're a hedge fund. And so it is amazing this disconnect between uh, AI in some people's expectations and the reality of the nitty gritty when we're working with data pipelines and building models, and feature drift, and as you say, Joe, structured data, like it is extremely, like I cannot fathom a system today that you could just feed in any kind of structured data. You just, here's a new table, figure it out mm -hmm. and uh, tell me what stocks to buy and sell. Like it's like, it's, it's <laughs> fantasy. But the thing is, though, I, I think back to your, the, the question, though, right? So why, why is it that, that companies want to jump into AI first? And I think, as you alluded to in this example, there's, there's a lot of FOMO, right, uh, if you're missing out. And what this does is it creates like a very uh, fascinating prisoner's dilemma game where the optimal decision is actually to, to do AI. You, you would, you, I mean, that would be the rational choice, right? And so your, your choice is to go and do that. Um, because well, your opponents are probably doing that too, and, and so on and so forth, um, and yeah, it, it's it, so I think a lot of that is maybe fear-driven marketing on the part of um, you know certain large companies, um, mm -hmm. you know. But it's also I, it, what I also notice is that there's um, you know I've worked with, I've worked with um, you know certain executives in the past where like the things they want to do is I want to be able to talk to my peers about the, all the AI I'm doing. Right. right. Whether or not I'm actually doing it or not, it's a different story, but I want to be able to talk about the fact that we have AI initiatives at my company. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it becomes uh, sort of this interesting, um, you know, uh, keeping up with the Joneses with uh, execs too. And I've seen this firsthand, which is why I know that like a lot of these companies want to jump straight into it, not necessarily because there's a practical use case, but because this is a great way for execs to get uh, promotions. You'll work at a company where, you know, they're doing like slightly cooler AI stuff. So right. it's a reality of it. So. Yeah, and so if people want to check out this uh, video that Joe did in late 2020, it's called How to Move from Barely Doing BI to Doing AI. That's what sparked this whole question. And um, yeah, thanks for the great and thorough answer, both of you. Um, we will include the link to that video in the show notes, as well as everything else that we can think of <laughs> that we've mentioned on the show. So we are nearing the end of this episode and something that we always ask guests. And for the first time, I'm going to be able to ask two guests this question. Do you have a book recommendation for us? Shall I go first? Yeah. So I'm going to recommend the book is actually more on my reading list that I've been reading about this concept and want to read the book that it comes from. But it's a book called The Gray Rhino by I think it's Michelle Wooker. And the idea is, uh, I think many of us have read books by Nassim Nicholas Tlaib, where he right. advocates for this notion of a black swan. Right. And Michelle says basically, well, actually, many of these events that we call black swans are highly, highly predictable, like a gray rhino, right? Doesn't mean 100% probability you're going to see a gray rhino, but it's a high probability. Mm -hmm. And so things like the COVID-19 pandemic, for example... Um, at least once it hit China, what we saw with U.S. businesses and policymakers is they kind of said, oh, you know, that's that's a Chinese problem. Maybe it will come here instead of saying, you know what, there's a high probability that it's going to cross our shores eventually. And uh, maybe we should do something about that. Mm. Oh. Cool. Um, Great rec my recommendation, we see uh, it's not Fifty Shades of Grey Rhinos, um, but uh, <laughs> um I think, okay, so I'm, I'm reading uh, Ministry of the Future right now. It's about climate change. I think that's a really good book. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I think my all-time favorite book is still uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac. So it's a collection of um, writings and talks from uh, Charlie Munger. Right. Like I, I consider to be, um, you know, the, the smartest person on the planet. So, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend that reaches, book. Supposedly he reads 500 pages a day. I wouldn't be surprised. He's... Uh, 
which is crazy because he's got like one eye. He, he, so he can, he's like, his eyes get tired. And I know that because we were, uh, Matt and I actually, uh, we were at a, a, a talk at uh, Charlie's um, Daily Journal uh, shareholders meeting a couple of years ago. And like he, um, you had to stand on a certain, you had to let him, if you're on his, uh, if you're on a certain side of him, you had to let him know because he can't see you. And so, right. uh, but the guy, he's, he's just, a, he's an information machine. I would say more importantly, it yeah. was a machine. I saw him um, actually at the uh, recent Berkshire meeting in Omaha um, a couple months ago. And I, I, I swear he gets smarter every year and he's like 98 right now, but I, I've seen him for a long time, but it's like he, for some reason it, it's contrary to human biology, but he just gets smarter and wiser every year. It's the weirdest thing. So yeah, there's scary. one of the, one of the, strongest negative correlations with developing Alzheimer's is um, level of education. Mm. So the, and the theory here is that the more that you learn, the more pathways that you create between memories and ideas in your brain. And so even if, so if let's pretend we have two identical people, <laughs> uh, twins uh, who are, you know, genetically exactly the same. And one of them, uh, you know, never does, doesn't learn very much, you know, is, is competent in the world, but, you know, doesn't read books, isn't trying to learn or grow. Uh, and then the other one finishes a PhD, becomes a data scientist, and then a data engineer. And their whole life is constantly uh, learning new ideas and concepts. They're always reading. Um, so even if both of those people due to that genetic predisposition, and let's say they have the same diet and other environmental factors or whatever, so that they develop Alzheimer's um, at the same rate in their brains, then the person who has all of these extra pathways, um, even as some of those pathways uh, get blocked, there are other ways of retrieving information um, that aren't available to the person who hasn't developed all those pathways. So that could be it. So if Charlie's reading 500 pages a day, um, you know, maybe there's, there's no reason to think that you would have any cognitive decline. Oh, no, no. And, and I think it's quite the contrary. He's, he's you know, him and Buffett, I would say, are, are just two of like, I would say the most active thinkers I've, I've seen. Uh, Gates is probably, you know, Bill Gates is probably among them too, but it's just, there's just, there's just a different level of, um, of, uh, I, I think curiosity. Um, the person I've, you know, as I said, uh, you know, the person I, I saw read the fastest was actually Kim Peek. So have you ever uh, watched the movie Rain Man? Or heard you know, of it? I haven't, but I know okay. it. Um, so it's about a savant, yeah. right? But but so yeah. it's based on somebody who actually lives in or lived in Salt Lake City, and and Kim Peek mm -hmm. was considered the human Google. So he um, and I, I've actually sat across from him and watched him because he was totally oblivious. I was sitting across from him. Uh, he he had his brain was like somehow fused, and so he was like a, on paper mentally disabled, but he could read like. Uh, I, probably a 300 page book and like 15 minutes, probably less actually. I clocked it. Um, and so, but he could read both pages simultaneously and just keep flipping like this. And he would have 99% right. recall. So you could ask uh, him any fact, like what day did this happen on? And be like, yeah, it's this. What are you talking about? Um, so, anyway, so that, I mean, that's another example too. I would say I've just, um, you know, you just never know, right? Like there's this, I mean, he's, you know, he was like a living Google. So, right. It just makes you wonder how many other people are like that. And like, you know, just, I, I think for me, what, what's interesting is just intellect's one of these things where I think we have, all of us probably have our own idea of what it is. Um, and then there's just other people who are just in completely different leagues in their own special way. So anyway, yeah, nice tangent, but... difficult word to define. And when you say fused, you mean that the two hemispheres of his brain yeah. weren't separated. Huh? No. Wow. Yeah. You should go, um, you should go watch a video on him sometime. Kim Peek. It's fascinating. Sounds know, cool. Yeah. I'll do that uh, my next meal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, that's like right, when I cool. watch stuff. Um, so awesome episode, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, this, my first three-way, I would say, was a great success. I'm glad we could uh, help you. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully the audience enjoyed this as well. So how can listeners keep up with the latest from both of you? Matt, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter, not really as active there, but I do have this ambition to try to be more active there. Uh, we also <laughs> have a weekly newsletter that comes out where we both write articles. And maybe, Joe, you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, it's on ternarydata.com right now. Uh, we're actually going to be moving it to uh, Substack very shortly. So that's actually the first time we announced it, but that'll be happening, um, the newsletter. So we've got um, 
it's a very popular underground newsletter, but unfortunately, if you aren't subscribed, <laughs> you can't get the articles. And we keep like right. to keep it that way. It's sort of like an underground mixtape um, from back in the day. But um, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm not on any of the social medias. You can actually find an article um, somewhere on the internet about why I'm not on any, any social media except for LinkedIn. Um, but that's how you can find me. So Cool. Sounds great. Well, it's funny that you say, I mean, LinkedIn is definitely a social media platform. Uh, and on that social media platform, <laughs> you have 23,000 followers. So, um, yeah, not, not doing a great job of, uh, of staying isolated from social media. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, we're out of time. I'm sure listeners can find, uh, that article. Maybe if you ping it over to me, Joe, I can make sure that that's in the show notes for people to read about why you're not on other uh, social media platforms. Um, super cool. Thanks so much for taking the time. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Joe. And looking forward to catching up with both of you again sometime. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks for having us. Well, I think it was pretty fun having two data engineering experts trade answering my questions and backing up each other's responses with even more rich detail. In today's episode, Matt and Joe filled us in on how pure mathematicians seem to be more drawn to data engineering while applied mathematicians and statisticians seem to be more drawn to data science. They talked about how their book, Fundamentals of Data Engineering, is not focused on specific technologies, but instead on the broader data engineering role, process, and philosophy. They talked about their six data engineering undercurrents, namely security, data management, data operations, data architecture, orchestration, and software engineering. They talked about how there are trade-offs in any data pipeline latency considerations, but faster is typically the default assumption. And they provided their data engineering top tips, including doing all work in the cloud as opposed to locally and ensuring cross-functional collaboration. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Joe and Matt's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 595. That's superdatascience.com slash 595. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like one audience member, Leandro, did uh, during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter, as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you to provide your inquiries. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Yvonne Siebert, Mario Pombo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogvang, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another awesome episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. <laughs>